Jeez. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> all right. We always get glitchy with this uh, Bluetooth. Should we start it off right now? Yeah. All right. Uh, I, hi there. I'm Dr. Chris. And I'm Alan Chatney. And this is the Source Points Podcast, where we ta- talk about all things oil industry, geophysics, uh, and sometimes movies. And today we have a guest. Yeah, we do. Uh, joining us today from RPS Group is Matthew Lennon. And uh, welcome, Matthew. Thanks, guys. Happy to be here. Yeah, great to have you. Um, so tell us a little bit about what you do at RPS Group and uh, kind of what that's all about. Sure. Uh, so... Like you said, my name's Matt. I graduated uh, a couple years ago from the University of Calgary, uh, studied geophysics and hydrogeology there. And uh, I've been working since January at RPS Group as a geophysical technician, and we do a lot of uh, consulting for oil and gas and potash clients and um, help them find resource. Fabulous. And and so you're no doubt a, a GIT, a geoscientist in training then? Are you in that category? Yes, sir. That's awesome. Uh, so we, one of the things we've seen, I think, Chris, you're our responsible member. Yes, I, I am very responsible. This is like Dr. Dr. Chris, Dr. Chris Harris. Responsible. Responsible member, which is, yeah, we, can, we won't make any jokes there. Uh, but uh, so we're always managing uh, our own GIT uh, thing. And one of the things we found is that through this downturn, a lot of people haven't kept up their APEGA uh, sort of registration, even though they've graduated with a geoscience degree. So... But you've yeah. obviously done that. Well, when your company helps you pay for it, it's uh, it's really nice. Oh, that's good. Yeah. yeah a lot yeah. of people have talked about that, about the price that's involved in keeping it up. Yeah. And mm-hmm. if you're unemployed and you're just out of school and you've got mm-hmm. student loans. And yeah, it's hard on the young guys sometimes, right? Or whoever's not working, it can be a challenge. So. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. We insist, of course, because of our uh, professional practice standard that we've got to keep, or professional practice management plan, as it were, that we've got to have everybody that is a geoscientist registered and so we help pay for that for our own yep. for our own folks that uh, that are in entry level positions as well, right. and awesome. uh, our own uh, who's no longer uh, technically at oh, Explorer, yes. Phil Sokol ended up getting his uh, professional designation after there, going so. back to school. He was a guest uh, one time, and he went back to school, but but it wasn't related with going back to school. It was just a timing thing, yeah, because right? he put yeah. in his five years, and so he goes, he's now a PGO. It took took a long time, but. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's uh, it's kind of cool. So okay, so um, but the reason you're here yes. is Junior Geophysicist Forum. That's right. That's something Al, you're familiar with. Chris, I'm sure you're very. I am familiar. not actually. I've never been to a Junior Geophysicist. Well, forum. you're gonna get familiar. It's all good. All right, rock um, and roll. Fill us in, son. Okay, this is. Uh, <laughs> I think we're on our 16th JGF this year, the Junior Geophysicist Forum. It's put on by the CSEG. Um, foundations mentorship program as well as the EPPs the emerging professionals program Um, and it's a kind of a joint event that kicks off the mentorship program for the year for the CSEG and it serves as kind of a great networking get to know you event Um, but we're going to change up the format a little bit this year so I'd love to talk about that as well yeah Um, yeah in in previous years we've had uh, a speaker panel uh, which has worked out really well and kind of some really interesting engaging conversation there and we've done uh, technical talks before that and stuff, but uh, this year we're going to open it, you know, right up, and we're going to have all of the uh, audience members participate in the discussion. So it should be a little bit more interesting. Oh, so you'll have to encourage questions from the floor. Oh yes, that's yeah. always a challenge. You know, there's a certain skill to getting that. You know, you sort of some people are very nervous to ask questions in front of a group, especially of their peers or. Well, sometimes you, know, you got to start off with funny things. Uh, you know, tell us a joke or. Right. Or bring up something, uh, some trivia to get everybody uh, putting their hands up and getting in on the action. I should take notes here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's right. It's it's good, and and so it's um, so let's make sure we get the date. We'll repeat that oh. throughout. It's October tenth. That's right. right. October tenth at the Petroleum Club, four thirty p.m. to seven thirty p.m. Four thirty till seven. Seven thirty. And Chris will definitely put that up on the. Uh, on the graphic or whatever you do. Yes. What do you call I that? A thumbnail or something? Uh, like that? Well, clickbait. Clickbait. <laughs> clickbait. You do a clickbait that has yeah. the date and the time on the, Absolutely. Uh, on the podcast. He's a social media pro. Yeah. Uh, I, right. I'm trying to be. Not. I don't. Uh, I'm not anywhere near some of the bigger guys out there. But I, I'm making my little dent, a little teeny tiny dent. Yeah. So does this uh, event cost anything for people who are attending? Free to attend. The only thing we request is a food bank donation for a drink ticket pretty good trade in my opinion that's right and uh yeah that'll help us uh 
you know, give back a little bit to the community, and it's something we always try to do every year is, is uh, have a little bit of social impact as well. So, Now, last year we were there, and we, we sponsored last year. I think it's our third year of really being involved, and I've really enjoyed it. In fact, I should say that from my perspective, uh, the JGF really inspired me to get hiring, mm. uh, uh, you know, sort of geoscientists that were fresh out of school. Today we've got uh, the first. The first in that category was Dan Lois, who we, we hired after he was uh, he was uh, laid off at uh, at Synovus. But since then we've hired I don't know a few dozen uh, yeah. uh, wow. folks. And today uh, our front desk is uh, our front desk administrator is a geologist. Uh, mm -hmm. a GIS analyst. Our GIS is, is a, a geologist, geologist as well. well. We've yeah. got, uh, yeah, we've got all kinds of um, team members that are that are, J that are junior geoscientists, not necessarily geophysicists, both, right. both geologists and geophysics. And yeah. both super important to continue that progression because, as I'm sure you know, not, not many companies are doing that right now. So um, Yeah, and I think the feedback we've had, at least from, from Dan and, and others, has been, um, you know, it's been good for them to see kind of the business side and the nuts and bolts and how does this work. Totally. Um, I'm interested, geophysical tech or uh, uh, geoscience tech, you must have sort of realized, oh my goodness, I didn't know about all these formats and headers and Absolutely. acidic <laughs> headers. And I thought segway was just segway. And it turns out there's different kinds. So wh why don't you share some of that experience? Sure. Well, I recently learned too that, that segway was originally written in, in Fortran. Is that true? Oh. I don't know, but it's probably old enough to have been Fortran. Yeah, so there's some legacy component to that. But, yeah, no, it's a different world compared to, you know, the typical uh, processing interpretation route to understand the kind of back-end formatting and data management. I think it's super important for any geoscientist, really, to know what that's all about, so I'm happy to be doing that right now. Yeah, so it's that's kind of <coughs> neat. One of, our, one of our main focus areas right now, since we uh, successfully uh, acquired uh, software, uh, business here on the 31st of August called Size Info. Oh yeah, is uh, which is data management software it deals with that with that sort of piece yeah. of the vertical integration uh, component, and um, and we've been thinking carefully about removing some of the obstacles that industry faces in terms of accessing their data. Right. So right now a lot of people will still store physical tapes in a warehouse somewhere off in right. you know northeast or southeast Calgary. Um, some people have it in their garage, I'm, I'm told. And if you listen very carefully, you can actually hear the future on our podcast. I was right noticing now. that. You I was <laughs> noticing that right now too, and there's yeah. nothing we can do let's about just, it. Let's just okay, uh, be quiet. Give, let's give a moment of silence for the death of tapes or, or non-silence. Listen. Yeah, yeah. Would what you're hearing is the humming of the fans. Turn around. The snowball. Uh, that is a 100 terabyte military grade hard drive. Wow! That has uh, been sent to us by Amazon Web Services, and we're loading, we're loading it up with uh, another wave of uh, seismic data. That'll bring us to, I guess, a tenth of a petabyte. Uh, yep. um, uh, online at, uh, and we're we're we've published that. We're we're moving to the cloud with all of our data. Yeah. So. And wow! Uh, so that's what you hear right now: the future of data. Yeah, it's kind of cool. It's kind of cool. Anyway, sorry, well done, we, we, uh, you were you were saying. Uh, uh, so what? where do you see your career going from here? Oh, man, uh, that's a great question. I think it's one that a lot of juniors have right now is mm. Uh, mm. what is the future hold? And um, I think a lot of us are thinking about how do we brand ourselves now and a lot of personal marketing and what does it mean to be a geophysicist or a data scientist or just a scientist in general? How do we how do we navigate that? So um, for me, it's about taking, you know, a broad scope of, of the skill set and, and seeing how I can add value in, in a lot of different ways, whether it be subsurface or now trying to add a data man management skill set of some kind so um it's pretty wide open guys and uh, uh you know i'm not sure where it's headed but uh, just be open to opportunities yeah it's kind of neat i i tell people that i am more optimistic today than i ever have been about the industry and i've been in mm -hmm. it 30 years i don't i don't know maybe i do look that old but i don't feel that old uh but i i and then i was at this um very interesting conference over the weekend it's called the Schachter energy conference so this is a Joseph Schachter has a um, um, newsletter that he publishes, and he sort of looks at the energy picture and, and tries to uh, make recommendations on buying and I guess sometimes mm -hmm. selling sh um, stocks in the energy space. And he's done some analysis. He's absolutely convinced we're at the beginning of a very long bull market run wow. in, uh, in oil and gas. Mm -hmm. And I, I know people start to despair at the end of these big, long, ugly bear markets. And I think that's part of the... Part of the undercurrent I for the JGF right. yeah. has been the last few years has been oh you know 
will there ever be a market? Will I ever get a job? It's been a bit depressing. Yeah, yeah. for sure. And uh, but I think I think it's sort of a case of hang in there. It's coming, mm -hmm. and uh, and we'll have to see how that uh, how that pans out. But I think I'm. I'm feeling very positive about. Well, it. yeah, you said that this morning in uh, in the office meeting, and you made a note that uh, it all started back in '09, at the or the financial crisis, and it's yeah, it was, it was '08. Oh. I remember '08 because it was my tenth wedding anniversary, and we were celebrating it in Italy, and I woke up one morning on that trip to watch uh, the collapse of Lehman Brothers, and I and my wife yeah. was saying sort of. What does this mean for us? And I said it means we should get on a plane and go home and stop <laughs> and, spending money and start working. <laughs> yeah, you, you had mentioned that, and I, you, and for me, I I thought that is when I finish my PhD, and that's pretty much when all hope was. I don't want to say lost, but it was like this rocky road from there on in. I would I'd pretty much envy anybody starting now. It's they've missed the worst of it. Right. Whereas uh, someone like me had to ride the non-wave of of rockiness all the way well and so much of the narrative has been around you know oh you know everything's going to be electric and you know we'll go to renewables and all this no. nothing, nothing could be further from the truth nothing could be further from the truth right now we're climbing through 100 million barrels a day now i don't know finding and producing 100 million barrels of oil a day that is a non-trivial thing yeah um, but can't you like put solar power things on everything? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Not possible. So, <clears throat> so to sustain that, and it's been just a straight line of growth of demand, more or less, other than seasonal fluctuations, but pretty much a straight line of growth for decades. And nothing is going. The I saw a fascinating slide. In fact, it was Schachter that presented the slide on the weekend. He, um, the average consumption per capita consumption in the U.S. has more or less remained flat at 20 something barrels per person per year something like that okay wow. uh canada it's a little higher because it's colder mm -hmm. uh we're something mm -hmm. like 23 24 uh, don't quote me on this but in that in that order right india 0. 0.5 mm. wow okay. and wow. so if you want to have any kind and the reason is because many many people wow, in india live in poor. abject poverty yeah, absolutely. and and energy consumption and wealth are directly uh, related, right? So, what we've seen in China is a massive explosion in, in energy consumption that mm -hmm. really drove the right. uh, drove pricing. F you know, uh, for the, the last race to while. middle class is causing the uh, that's right consumption that's of right. energy. And and uh, so let's I think uh, you know a lot of us think that uh, India will be will be one of the key drivers along with China uh, as we go forward. Uh, you know, there are billions of people who would like to live better, happier, more prosperous, healthier lives. And, and that's what we do in the oil industry. So I'm pretty excited about it. That's awesome. I was going to have a question. Uh, I got a question about uh, GITs. And how long does it usually take someone to go from, from point A to point B in that process? The GIT to the PGO? Or yeah, yes. Uh, it says about four years of, uh, of steady work experience. And that's with, you know, somebody shadowing you and, and over overseeing what you're doing for work and um, I've done a few contract jobs where I'm, I'm kind of hoping that I can justify that those are our reasonable geoscience experience but right right yeah you're thinking about that see the reason Chris you can ask that is because you took way longer I took ex <laughs> well I in my defense what I I took way longer because I was I was in academic life forever and uh I didn't have to get a P any GIT PGO right, right. designation whatsoever. And oddly enough, I got mine out of the blue cause I had applied for it. Do I say this? I failed the test the first time <laughs> <laughs> in my defense. It's because I was going to Australia and in Australia, there is no, you're talking no. years ago, years ago, yeah. years ago now, years ago now, geoscience is not a governed profession in Australia. Oh. So I saw no reason to continue on even, no, of course not. Put it was a down. one. It was a one-way trip for you. Too. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I thought it was a one-way trip, and Welcome then back. yeah, well, exactly. I mean, yeah. here I'm now, and for me, I, I then I took the test again, passed it, and I got it. I received my my PGO overnight. You're was, talking about the ethics test. Yeah, it was the weirdest family. thing. But uh, so in my mind, I don't know. I I have no idea the the, the time frames involved in any of this. So you became ethical at <laughs> some point. <laughs> somewhere between the <laughs> age of 30. Yeah, and yeah <laughs> somewhere between my multiple moves back and forth between Australia. Gotcha. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, it's neat. And and that is what it is, right? And you're allowed, I think your first year can be kind of uh, a little bit non-technical or less technical work. And then the expectation is that the following three years are, are uh, professional yeah, or, you know, supervised professional work. And, and uh, that's all documented. And so right. good to hear you're, you're doing that. What kind of turnout do you think we'll have? Uh, you know, historically, we've seen between 120 to 200 people. And we're hoping to, to hit kind of right in the middle of that around 150 would be ideal. And, um, you know, that counts on, on things like this to get the message out. It's, it's such a great event for, for young geos and, and senior geos alike to attend. Um, it's an opportunity, if you haven't gotten involved with the mentorship program, to start getting involved, um, start giving back, or start learning a little bit more and engaging with the, the geophysics community that you have so much access to. It's, it's absolutely essential that we support each other, that we think and build for mm -hmm. the future. In fact, mm -hmm. just before we started this podcast, I was having a meeting wherein we were talking about succession planning for one of our key positions. And of course, the thought is, okay, let's move a geoscientist into that position because w that's what we should be doing, right? right? And so even though these might be operational positions, we're saying, uh, let's get somebody that also has the scientific background as well to, right, try, and right. to try and round out that. And, and that's not to take anything away from field experience. I'm a school of hard knocks guy myself, mm -hmm. and so that just raw experience is incredibly valuable absolutely and it's kind of its own education of sorts uh but it's nice to have well the more well-rounded and diverse we can be i think the better off we are mm -hmm. excellent yeah i think that's the kind of uh conversations that need to be happening these days and um uh, it's going to be interesting this year at the jgf because uh literally we're going to be taking everybody who comes in through the door and say what do you want to talk about today um, we've got four interesting topics that uh, that hopefully people will really connect with and, and oh so you really are mixing the format up oh yeah it's gonna be it's gonna be different we're taking a bit of a risk here but uh, do you mind if I walk through what we're yeah what do we're it doing do it that, yeah. yeah go ahead that'd be great because um, hopefully these will resonate with uh, with the whole audience out there um, one is a uh, is building an energy policy roadmap and what that means is we're gonna kind of develop some discussion around what is Kennedy Canada's energy policy like right now where is it maybe headed what kind of bits of information should geophysicists be looking for, you know, in the news? What should they be talking about? How do they shape their careers based on that kind of information? Do they need to be looking for international work? Do mm. they need to, mm. you know, double down on, on working in the oil sands or something like that? Um, so that should be interesting. Um, uh, one that I'm most excited about and I hope can get a draw is organizational dynamics. And this is the whole idea of AI and automation. And where's the future of our jobs going? Mm. And so this is something that's going to affect every industry every career in some way or another good topic good topic yeah so we'll see where that heads and and what people's thoughts are i don't know that a lot of geophysicists are necessarily thinking about or worried about how automation is going to affect their jobs but maybe i'm mm -hmm. wrong i think we're going to get a lot of input there so um economic value this is something that we visit all the time the vig group the value in geophysics group um value and integrated geophysics sorry talks about you know how are we actually adding value to the bottom line and and how do we remind the entire industry and the community that we're important and in these different ways right and lastly is uh, new data tools which is a a bit of a buzzword these days you know how are how are people uh, changing in terms of their analytics approach and how are we looking at data differently than we used to 10 25 years ago yeah those are going to be fascinating topics mm -hmm. uh all of them i mean it Let's, can we talk about all of them? Can you choose all? I'd love to. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, could be a very long. Could be a very long session. The only thing is, uh, Matt doesn't have a very long <laughs> session to talk about right now, unfortunately. So we're, I'm being mindful of time for him. Oh well, yeah. Thanks, Do you Chris. have a, you have a cap? But uh, yeah. Oh, you got to be out of here by three. We're is that the deal? Three three oh five. We're okay. <laughs> three oh five. That, that leaves ten minutes of movies. Uh. Yeah. There you go. Well, <laughs> I, I'm a movie I buff. Just, I, I did. I did just want to touch on one thing, and that is that you know we have carefully been thinking about this space of machine learning mm, and AI absolutely. and data yep. analytics and all of that. And what's become very, very clear is that, and it, and it ties to value, by the way, mm. because today it's that separation between uh, brains and data, right? So much data is just tucked away in a warehouse on some magnetic tape somewhere and it takes so long and it's it costs and and it just takes a while to get your hands on it and and put it serve it up on a workstation let alone build a machine learning algorithm that can query all of that data efficiently mm -hmm. and right. so so that is why you hear the hum of the snowball in the background that is why uh, we picked up size info it's why we're looking at that space it's because we're thinking about how is industry going to actually connect to data in a direct way 
uh, Elias, who, uh, who's been doing a bit of work with us, Elias Carciente, uh, data scientist, uh, software guy, uh, did some time, I think, with uh, IHS and possibly Schlumberger and maybe Conoco uh, and others. Anyway, um, he uh, just finished a, sort of a data science boot camp thing that lasted a few months where he did a query, a machine learning query, uh, looking for salt amongst something like 20,000 seismic images. Wow. And, and to kind of do work that humans could just never kind of get, would literally take a lifetime to do the work. Right. And, and it's just really exciting for me. The other discussion I had was with somebody from Halliburton. They ran a test running an algorithm on, a, on the cloud on a 600 gigabyte stack volume uh, to do automated fault interpretation. They said normally even on a big server farm, this would take weeks. Uh, they, they banged it off in five hours. Yeah. Wow. Using high powered computing. So if you're cloud. not doing that, what's wrong? Yeah, if I, I mean that's right. If you're it not able to do that, you're you're ta spending a lot of time waiting for the hourglass to flip over on your screen. Mm -hmm. uh, that 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 could be spent more productively. Yeah, I, I could see it being in a very intim intimidating topic for a lot of people to talk about, but uh, you know you can't sweep it under the rug. This is the way the things are being done now, and they're going to be done even more in the future. So how, how are we going to fit ourselves into those pictures with l machine learning as part of it? Well, and it's and a great in topic. Your, like in, in your world, GIS. Oh, absolutely. Too. I right? went to a I went to a talk and uh, the, the guy was in, I forget his name now, but he was energetic and he had a great quote at the end. And it's something we have to be really cognizant of the last. And he's, he projects this way into the future. And he said, the, as far as computer learning goes and machine learning one of the last jobs humans are going to have are telling computers what things are right teaching the computer. teaching teaching, teaching to label yeah phone <laughs> button <laughs> yeah. yeah uh i mean because again when you for me when you talk about say auto it's going through and finding uh fractures computer doesn't know what a fracture is Right. No, it's, we, but we, it's taught a characteristic. We're telling it what a fracture is. We're labeling it fracture, and it goes, okay, yeah, fires through done. as fast as it can. And that's a good thing. And it finds fractures that you might not see with the, uh, with the because you're not right. looking at it digitally. You're not looking at it. I think it's a great topic, and yeah. it needs to be. It's it really needs exciting. To, like, if, for, for me, I'd, if they, I think you could almost do that in like That would take forever to talk about. Yeah, exactly. Well, here's the exciting thing, too, is we're hoping to follow a lot of these topics up especially the areas that people are most interested in at the event and uh, you know hosting further events that are really going to allow them to dig into the details. So and when, when was that event again? It's o October 10th, 4.30 to 7.30 at the Petroleum Club. All right. And you can register online on the CSED website on the events page. And you do have to register, is that right? You want people to register so that you know your number's going in? We like to do that, yeah. It's, it's easier on us. But, you know, if you forgot to register and you want to come last minute, happy to have you. Yeah. Uh, what if you got a sellout crowd and 400 people yeah. show up? All right. Well, then we're going to have to turn you away. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So register. You heard it from Matt. All right. Register away. We're conscious of Matt's time. We got to we gotta wrap things Sorry up here guys. pretty quick. But Th that's three. Oh, no, that's good. That's good. And we, we've got our outro music. We have our outro music. Oh, right on. So this has been uh, podcast number what? Oh, it's six, <laughs> I think. Oh, no. Oh, this we never got this far in the song before. That's not the that's not the outro music. This is it? Yeah. No. It's now. It is now. <laughs> it's the bridge. There oh. it is. Anyway, this has been Source Points. I'm Dr. Chris. And I'm Alan Chatney. Uh, until next time, uh, keep rocking. Thanks, Matt. Thank you guys. <laughs>